It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to the LA River Fish Passage and Habitat Structures Design Workshop. Um, it's great to see so many of you taking time out of your, your week. Um, and it's with um, generous support from the State of California's oh. Wildlife Conservation Board that we're able to start our week focused on the potential for fish passage in the LA River, which has been um, a really exciting process for us. And it's in collaboration with agencies and stakeholders that over the years, the council has been uh, monitoring the LA River and building on the work of many of, um, many of those that are participating today. And it's in collaboration, um, again, that we come together this morning to learn, to share, and to focus our discussion on the fish passage mm -hmm. in the LA River. So I'd like to thank Wendy and her team for put, pulling us together and uh, setting up the program for the, this morning. And with that, I'll pass it to her and um, we're excited to be part participating. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Eileen. So we're gonna look at our agenda. Um, this, this should go till about noon and um, we'll start off with talking about ob objectives, the purpose of the meeting. Um, there will be opportunities, uh, three different opportunities for us to just talk and have some time to discuss and react to the design, um, to think about uh, the fisheries objectives and needs, uh, water needs. And um, those discussion points will be around 1030, another one at 1130, and then right before noon, we'll have a, a final closeout. Um, so the agenda really is pretty simple. It's a three-point agenda. So we'll give you an overview of the project. We'll get into steelhead targets, past, present, and future, looking at the science of the limiting factors, analysis, and conceptual ecological model, what that process is all about, the content and the outcomes. You have a chance to talk about that with us. And then we'll get into the design right away, look at the regulatory, um, constraints and opportunities coming out of a lot of pre-meetings with uh, the City of LA, um, Council for Watershed Health, coordinating agencies and partners. And really the purpose of this is to, to push forward on the fish passage design and really to focus on the preliminary design phase, um, looking at design targets, um, the modeling for hydrology, hydraulics, sediment, and other related fish passage design study questions. <coughs> so looking at our org chart, we have um, at the top, um, really thankful to the Wildlife <coughs> Conservation Board, Don Crocker, who's on the phone with us. And so thank you, Don. Um, this is a Prop 68 grant, and it's specifically for fish passage. Um, we also are very thankful for Eileen and Andrea and Cass and uh, Urelli at the Council for Water <coughs> Health, providing great leadership for our team and, the lead, and being lead grant proponent. Um, also, lead agency, City of LA. We're so thankful for the mayor's office, for Edward and Michael, uh, for Jan, for Susan, and all these folks, Maria, uh, James, and Master Jerry at LA San, helping us to um, move through the design and uh, stay aligned with the city's goals and objectives for sustainability and biodiversity and water. And also, uh, we're very thankful for our, our partners and technical experts from SCORP um, that are on the phone with us as well, Eric and uh, Katie and Jenny, um, working with us on limiting factors for steelhead and the modeling. Uh, we have the Bureau of Reclamation. It all started there with um, uh, a great vision and idea. Um, and so we're, we're so glad that Doug, Doug and um, Nathan and um, Jennifer and others from the Bureau are also with us. So at this time, um, we're just gonna do some brief self-introductions. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I needed to thank also Tim Brick and Folar, um, Shelley, and and others uh, who are also our partners um, in outreach, education, and, and really pushing forward uh, the agenda for native fish and aquatic species. Um, and of course, our coordinating agencies. You can see them all there um, with the county, the core. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NIMS, and CDFW. So it wouldn't be possible without uh, their involvement and their leadership um, setting setting the, the future plans for the LA River in motion. Um, so we're, we're going to segue to self intros for the presenters only. So we'll start off with AJ. <clears throat> Good morning, folks. My name is AJ Keith. I'm a senior aquatic ecologist and fisheries biologist with Stillwater Sciences. Good morning. This is Ed Wallace. I'm a principal with Northwest Hydraulic Consultants, helping with uh, hydrology and hydraulics and fish passage design. Good morning, Johannes Beebe. I'm a senior hydrologist with Stillwater Sciences and I'm um, helping with design. Good morning, this is Isaac Brown. I'm an ecologist and physical planner looking at the opportunities and constraints across the 4.8 miles and the broader watershed. June? Okay, I don't know if June's on or muted. June. Hi, this is June Wang with TRC. I'm water resource engineer. I'm supporting the hydraulic design of the fish passage. Fish passage. Thank you. Hello, this is Nathan Holsty. I'm a hydraulic engineer with the Bureau of Reclamation. I'll be helping with design and doing a lot of the numerical hydraulic modeling. Hello, I'm Travis Stroth, uh, river restoration engineer with Stillwater Sciences, also helping with the design. Great, thank you. We have others from our team on the call, but for the purpose of time, we're moving on to describe the project and we'll get into questions and things like that. Uh, where others can participate. So this project is a 4.8 mile reach of the Los Angeles River um, going through downtown. It starts at the transition of the soft bottom to concrete line channel just upstream of the Arroyo Seco confluence and continues downstream to Washington Boulevard, approximately 20 miles um, from that point to the ocean. Uh, the renderings that you see are from the revitalization LA River master plan um, on the top right and uh, below is with the Army Corps and City of LA's integrated feasibility report for the LA River ecosystem restoration project that's piggy backyard and um, part of this this reach as well. So for the goals and objectives, we really looked at adopted plans um, for this uh, project study area, and you'll see more about that as we progress through this presentation. Also, aligning with the Wildlife Conservation Board grant and strategic plan focusing on fish passage and critical success factors laid out by the uh, Mayor's Office City of LA and the county, the core, and many others um, who are vital to the success of this project. So walking through what these goals and objectives look like, they're very um, related one to another. And first of all, we are focusing on creating steelhead fish passage as a migration corridor. This is a pilot project. It is the first for the LA River watershed focused on migration. And the goal is to provide passage to the upper tributaries during migration periods. So that would be the Arroyo Seco and Tahunga uh, watershed spawning grounds. Second is to implement the LA River Ecosystem Restoration Alternative 20 integrated feasibility report, congressional authorization. We need to be consistent and align with um, that authorization. Third is uh, really more of a linkage to implement um, the Arroyo Seco since the project is 
uh, at the confluence of the Alley River and the and the Arroyo Seco and the fish need to pass upstream. The uh, Army Corps ecosystem restoration watershed study recommendations for fish passage, barrier removal, naturalization and habitat improvements uh, for multiple life stages of the fish um, is, is another objective. And then related to that are all the other aquatic species that would benefit from this project and link to other pilot projects for recovery of native fish in their watershed and upper tribs, as well as wildlife connectivity. Um, and then related to that, we are adopting basically this project is an implementation to adopt plans, policies, recommendations on federal, state, regional, and local scales, including the, the National Marine Fisheries Service, Southern Steelhead Recovery Plan, the Greater LA River, IRWMP, um, sustainability and biodiversity objectives for the city of LA, and many other adopted plans um, in the upper trips as well as throughout the watershed. And finally, to connect habitat, people, and other planning projects in alignment with these adopted policies, programs, and plans. And we'll share more about that as we move forward. So this time I'm going to take a uh, segue to AJ Keith, who will talk about steelhead in the river. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. As long as everyone can hear me okay, I will, uh, I will move ahead here. Please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I wanted to run through the approach that we're taking to understand uh, steelhead and, and really put together as much information as we can on steelhead in the Los Angeles River, um, acknowledging that there are currently no steelhead in the Los Angeles River. Um, but what do we know about this iconic fish that used to occupy the watershed? And how can we use this information to um, provide a, a really sound biological basis for our, our habitat restoration and, and design work here in the main stem of the river in the in the 4.8 mile reach that Wendy uh, walked you through here. Um, so um, going back to the key question, what do we know about steelhead in the Los Angeles River? Um, there are other questions that we, we needed to ask ourselves. How did they complete the freshwater portion of their life cycle in the, in the watershed? How often and under what conditions did they reach spawning habitat in the upper, upper tributaries? Um, and really what limited their success in the watershed? And we're asking these questions because we, again, we want our restoration design to, to have a sound biological basis. Um, so, so how do we use this information to help identify um, key considerations for fish passage uh, and habitat design? Well, um, you know, we look at things like um, migration timing and rate, and this is based primarily on, uh, you know, information from steelhead in other watersheds along the Pacific coast and in Southern California to the extent that we can find the information. And we want to try and understand as best we can, you know, how and when steelhead used the watershed. Um, how did they use the main stem of the river? Um, did they need, did they use it, you know, specifically just as a migration corridor? How long uh, did they spend in the, in the main stem? Was there a need for them to rest or hold, as we say, um, during their upstream migration? Um, and what happened during their downstream migration? How important was the tributary habitat? So we're compiling as much information as we can, again, to provide a biological basis uh, for the design. And this is especially difficult because there are no steelhead now, and there really are no historical data for the watershed that we can rely on. But we can hypothesize and compile data from other systems um, and also try and understand the former conditions, the historical conditions under which steelhead evolved in the watershed. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, we do know that until the 1940s, the LA River supported a population of Southern California steelhead. Um, here on the bottom right is allegedly the last steelhead caught in the river in 1940, I believe. Um, and, you know, we have, 
we have good confidence that they spawned and reared in the tributaries in the upper watershed located in the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, the map on the left is from the NIMS recovery plan, the, the 2012 recovery plan, as is the um, kind of the, uh, the matrix here with the colored squares. Uh, that's a threats matrix. Um, so the uh, on the map to the left in the orange oval is really kind of the center central portion of our project area. It includes the LA River and the Arroyo Seco there, just, just for some geographical context. Um, Population-wise, LA River, uh, Steelhead and the LA River are considered part of the Mojave Rim uh, population group. They're considered a core three population for recovery planning purposes, meaning um, that this population is not the very highest priority, um, but it still has uh, very good potential. Um, and this project, this restoration and habitat improvement uh, and pasture improvement project is consistent with several of the priority actions identified by the National Marine Fishery Service or NIMFS um, in their 2012 recovery plan. And so implementation of this project would help address several of these, um, these key threats to steelhead in the watershed. And I'll, I'll run through a few of those. Next slide. Um, yeah, so the the threats affecting steelhead recovery in the Los Angeles River watershed really stem from urbanization. Um, recent fish surveys in the main stem of the river over the last few decades have documented uh, very few uh, native fish in the river, virtually none in the main stem. Um, as Wendy mentioned, this project is intended as a pilot to demonstrate the feasibility and habitat improvements in the, in the main stem. And, you know, we do have an acknowledged focus on steelhead. This project addresses the first two threats listed here, you know, habitat simplification and loss and loss of um, habitat connectivity. So the loss of the ability for migratory species like steelhead to, to move upstream and downstream. Um, so this project is just a piece of the larger puzzle. And we recognize that, um, you know, this alone, this, this 4.8 mile reach alone, um, no matter how amazing it ends up being, it won't bring back steelhead or the other native fish, you know, throughout the watershed. But it, it does show what's possible. And we hope it'll provide a, a, a really successful example of how to begin solving the problem here. So moving along, um, I want to say a little bit about the process that we're undertaking. Uh, we're developing a conceptual ecological model and we're doing a limiting factors analysis. And, you know, the conceptual model really just describes, it's a way of describing our understanding of the life cycle and ecolog ecological interactions of the steelhead population that formerly occupied the watershed. Um, and it, again, it helps identify the key considerations for fish passage and habitat design, things like um, the migration timing during during what portion of the season and during um, what types of river flows did steelhead move upstream and downstream? How fast did they move upstream in particular? Um, and that helps us answer questions like, was there a need for this holding habitat, you know, places for them to rest um, during their upstream migration? Um, and also things like importance of the tributary habitat. So the conceptual ecological model is, is not a quantitative or numerical model, but it is, it's a life stage specific model um, based on the best available data supplemented by, um, you know, reasoned hypotheses where we have data gaps. And, you know, many of you are probably familiar with conceptual models, um, including one for the Los Angeles River developed by the Army Corps. Um, and our steelhead conceptual model is similar, but it's just more focused on steelhead. Um, and, you know, example outcomes of the of the conceptual model would be things like, uh, like I mentioned, you know, the timing and habitat use of each life stage, migration, spawning, rearing, um, the, the migration rate, how fast did they migrate upstream, um, you know, it's hypothesized based on, again, information from other systems, um, and the passage window, which is extremely important during what portion of the year and during what uh, types of flows did they migrate upstream and what were the water temperatures during those times? Um, did water temperature prohibit or truncate the migration window? So with virtually no steelhead data for this watershed, shed, we're developing the conceptual model, um, again, using data from other, other populations in California and the Pacific Northwest. 
and um, looking closely at what we know about the historical condition of the Los Angeles River watershed. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, understanding the effects of threats and stressors on steelhead or other native fish really does require an understanding of the life history and ecology. Um, you know, here in the middle, this is a life cycle diagram, um, you know, showing uh, how they move from estuary and the, you know, up from the ocean into the upper tributaries to spawn. Um, if steelhead have a remarkable uh, flexibility in their life history, they can become resident and essentially then they're known as rainbow trout. And those trout can contribute uh, offspring that do uh, migrate downstream to the ocean. And so um, these resident populations are extremely important, uh, especially in Southern California. Um, and down at the bottom, you see a Gantt chart style table that just shows the, um, the key period of upstream and downstream migration. The juvenile is downstream is actually on the top row and it extends from about December through June or July based on the best information that, that we could locate. Um, so we want to understand these, um, the life cycle and the ecology. Um, and we want to understand what factors, um, what environmental or other factors formerly exerted the, you know, the strongest controlling influences on the population. In other words, uh, what were the limiting factors? Um, and those limiting factors are largely informed by this conceptual ecological model or the, you know, the understanding of the, the fish ecology and life history. Um, so we want to we want to do our best to understand which stressors are likely to act at which times and which locations in the watershed and how important they are at the population level. And this information provides the biological basis for our restoration and passage improvements. In other words, you know, a restoration design would not work very well. Cherries and berries if it targets the wrong life stages um, or time periods a, or locations yeah, food, like water cold pork marin and chicken pepper. could everyone uh please mute their mics i'm hearing some background noise um, that might be a little distracting to some people so next slide please we um part of the uh, um information gathering that we that we have been doing is to look back and you know and and try and characterize the historical conditions in the watershed so that we understand you know what what these factors were that that previously you know exerted a strong influence or limited the population and one of these things is you know looking at historical time series of photographs like this one showing the confluence with the arroyo seco here um and you know entering into the main stem river right in our pro the upstream end of our project reach and you can see in 1928 uh, both the Arroyo Seco and the LA River um, had a multi-threaded channel. They they had a um, their 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 river corridor was not as constrained by urbanization and channelization. And by 1960, it pretty much you know pretty much looked like it does today. And um, the photo on the right is is definitely you know present day urbanized channelized rivers. Um, and then the next slide shows a similar time series comparison of aerial photographs right at the mouth of the river at the estuary. And one of the interesting things to see here is back in 1928, you could see that there was a beach, there was sand there. And that, um, you know, as many of you probably know, um, you know, in a natural uh, estuary along the coast, the, uh, the formation and breaching of the sandbar actually controls when uh, anadromous fish like you know, steelhead and salmon and even lamprey are able to access um, freshwater habitat so, or, or access the ocean. So um, there, you know, back in the 20s, there may have been some natural uh, formation and then periodic breaching of a sandbar, which would have controlled the, um, the access of steelhead, uh, both upstream and downstream. Uh, but by 1960 and certainly before that, it was um, very much engineered and channelized and uh, no more sandbar. So um, this is this is um, just a snapshot of our historical ecology analysis that we're using to try and better inform our conceptual model and in turn um, provide a sound basis for our designs. So next slide, please. So based on this kind of information, this historical ecology analysis, we can 
we can make some recent assumptions uh, about things like historical flow patterns in the river, uh, which reaches were likely perennial and flowed year round and which only flowed seasonally or in response to storms and how this affected the steelhead's life cycle and ecology. And you can see in this conceptual diagram on the um, you know, the reaches in solid blue are those that likely had perennial flow, uh, year round flow. Um, and this provides a strong indication of the types of habitat these reaches provided for steelhead, um, as opposed to the dotted, you know, uh, river channels here, the, the dotted lines that um, likely were, um, you know, either potentially perennial, uh, we're not really sure, or ephemeral, you know, that basically they dried up uh, in the dry season. Next slide, please. So uh, from this type of information, we can make deductions supported by some historical accounts as well that the upper tributary reaches, and particularly the Arroyo Seco, which is pictured here on the left um, in a historical photo, um, and Big Tahunga Creek almost certainly provided the only perennial habitat suitable for spawning and rearing, um, at least as far as we know, and that the mainstem LA River and the downstream reaches of the tributaries even, as shown in, in the, the conceptual diagram on the right with the, you know, the dotted lines, um, served primarily as migration corridors during the winter uh, and possibly only when storm driven flows were high enough to provide continuous habitat connectivity from the ocean to the upper tributaries and, and back downstream for the juveniles to leave and make their way to the ocean. Next slide. Um, another part of the watershed characterization that has helped us identify some of the limiting factors uh, for steelhead in the watershed and inform our designs are, um, you know, migration barriers and impediments. And, to, you know, we compiled uh, a list of potential migration barriers along the route that steelhead would take uh, upstream from the ocean into the tributaries. And we started with the statewide fish passage assessment database or PAD. Um, and that's uh, those locations in the, in the database are shown on, on the California map in the lower left. Uh, we compiled a table that included these for the LA River. Uh, in the tributaries, but also included some sites that we identified based on our own reconnaissance and uh, photographs. And we, uh, we further evaluated these to identify potential fish passage barriers and classify them according to the type of barrier that they were, either structural or hydraulic barriers that could provide, or sorry, that could pose a barrier based on depth or velocity being um, prohibitively uh, shallow or velocity, you know, being prohibitively high um, to provide suitable passage conditions for that. So the map that we developed is on the right. Um, and again, these are locations where, um, you know, some sort of additional analysis or a fish passage, passage solution would be required uh, to provide unimpeded upstream and downstream passage for these fish. All right, let's move along. Next slide. Uh, another thing we looked at is the flows in the river, um, you know, currently in the historical flows as well. Um, you know, the historical flow data only starts in the, I believe it's the early 1930s, um, which is after there was considerable urbanization um, already, and there were dams on the major tributaries, and most notably on the Arroyo Seco and Big Tahunga Creek. The dams had already gone in by the 30s, but or by the time that they installed the stream gauges in the river. So we don't have any reliable data prior to that. Uh, but we do have various ways of looking at the data to show how flows in the main stem have changed over time. And, and this chart right here just illustrates um, in blue the average monthly flow in the main stem LA River before the wastewater treatment plants be, uh, began coming online. Um, so this is the blue is prior to 1965. And as most everyone is aware, the wastewater treatment plants um, actually augment flow from their effluent. Uh, they increase the flow in the river. So, and you can see this in the chart. The, um, the red bars here um, show flow starting in 1986 through 2013. And you can see that um, there's been a substantial increase in the average monthly river flow. And the reason we chose 86 is because that's that's right after the last of the um, the large wastewater treatment plants came online and began um, discharging its effluent into the river. And it's interesting that 
this increase in the average monthly flow, you know, both in the winter and in the summer uh, base flow, this could actually be beneficial for steelhead migration by um, providing increased depth in the channel during the dry season. Um, but, you know, we acknowledge that changes uh, may be uh, in the future in terms of, um, you know, the wastewater treatment plant effluent. So we're, we're looking at that as well. Um, next slide, please. We also looked at water temperature and unfortunately there, the water temperature data available for the basin are very spotty, um, but we did, we did locate and analyze with the help of um, folks at CWH and the uh, um, Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains. Thank you everyone. Um, we located some data um, on the left are the data from the USGS gauge at Long Beach or a couple of gauges as, actually, uh, which recorded daily maximum temperatures from 1973 through 1992. Um, and at the right, we're showing selected locations from a study by Jennifer Mongolo et al. Um, for the summer of 2016. And these are locations, um, we chose some of the locations where they sampled, but they sampled throughout the watershed, um, including in the main stem Los Angeles River and some of the tributaries. Um, so the, the data on the left again show the daily maximum temperatures um, and they are <clears throat> they are color coded so that um, really the the yellow or the gold temperatures or yeah the temperature data in the yellow and gold during the summer um, that is not considered to be the migration period and so we wanted to highlight in blue on the left chart uh, the, the water temperatures down near the river mouth uh, that occurred during uh, during this, you know, likely steelhead migration period from about December through, um, you know, into June. Um, the the chart on the right it shows the seven day moving average of the daily maximum temperatures, and then in the sort of pink bar, we've superimposed the zone, which is generally considered to be stress stressful at the lower end or lethal to steelhead um, to show sort of where things start to heat up and get uh, unsuitable for steelhead. So um, on the right again, this only shows conditions during a single summer, but if we if we consider this fairly typical, we can see that the water temperatures um, in the main stem LA River, which are the gray and the black symbols near the top of the chart, are too high for steelhead all summer long. Whereas temperatures in the Arroyo Seco um, which are shown here in purple and green, two different locations, are sometimes suitable and, during the summer and sometimes in the danger zone. And um, incidentally, it's interesting to see that Compton Creek, a small tributary, um, which is shown on this chart in orange, um, it has a natural bottom. It enters the, uh, it has riparian vegetation. And even though it, it, it is on the coastal plain, um, it enters the LA River in the lowermost part of the watershed. It's remarkably cool during the summer, probably because uh, it does have uh, riparian vegetation that shades the channel, and um, it also has a natural bottom, and it may have some groundwater influence. So essentially what we're seeing here is that it, it is possible, um, and very likely in fact, that water temperatures during the summer um, would constrain any sort of habitat use, um, including migration by steelhead uh, in the main stem, but not so much in the tributaries. It looks like some of the tributaries may be suitable during the summer, and this is important information. All right, let's move along. Uh, in the interest of time, finally, I wanted to illustrate, um, here we see the assumed steelhead migration period based on data um, from other systems, you know, again, along the top, uh, extending from essentially December through June or July. And if you go to the next slide, that's shown uh, shaded in blue here. And what we've done is superimpose this on the average annual, annual hydrograph for the LA River main stem. So you can see, um, you can see that maybe half or even two thirds of the presumed migration period occurs when flows are relatively high. So during the, you know, during the high flow time of the year, but there is a portion, if you go to the next slide, of the migration period, um, you know, that uh, is when temperatures are just, just too high, June and July. Um, so next slide, we can rule that out. We can, and so this truncates the migration period. Um, now we're looking at December through, um, through May, 
But if you go to the next slide, you know, the, the water temperature data are spotty, but um, seem to indicate that temperatures are starting to climb into the danger zone during April and May. So this would further truncate the migration period. So what we're looking at now is a likely migration period for steelhead of December through about March with a possibility of April and May. Um, and this is important because this provides key information uh, that translates directly to design. Um, we need to know when we're looking at design flows, in other words, what flows um, are we designing for, for passage? Um, when would those flows occur and how frequently? Okay, well with that, I will essentially wrap things up um, by just outlining the outcomes of our conceptual model and limiting factors analysis. Um, first, really, you know, we want to identify the ecological requirements of steelhead in the LA River um, and the factor, factors that would be likely to limit a reestablished population. Um, this provides really critical information to inform our fish passage and habitat restoration designs in the 4.8 mile project reach. It helps us identify priority studies and analyses as well to test hypotheses and fill the data gaps that, that may remain. Um, and finally, we wanna make sure that uh, we understand how best to link this project up and align with other restoration and ecological enhancement efforts in the watershed that will benefit not only steelhead, but other species, other native species, including other native fish. And with that, I'll turn it over to our next presenter. When will there be time for questions or is there a way to chat questions? Yes, hi Sabrina. We'll be breaking for questions in just a few moments. So once we get through um, Johannes talking about hydrology in the next 10 minutes, then we'll we'll have um, a period for discussion and questions. And you can also, um, there's a little comment icon um, that you can type in your questions as well during the presentation and we can be responding to those. OK, go ahead. Johan. Oh, no, this is Ed. I'm sorry, Ed Wallace talking yeah. about fish passage first. <clears throat> All right, Ed Wallace. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fish passage design targets. And we're really just at the beginning of developing specific uh, design targets and criteria for fish passage. Uh, and we just want to discuss the approach for their development and some of the preliminary work. So I'm going to introduce the subject of design criteria or targets here, and then later in the presentation, you'll see how they relate to design concepts. Next slide, please. Um, so as AJ said, we are primarily focused on passage for Southern California steelhead trout, and uh, he discuss the biological basis for the passage season and, and looking at the, the flows in the passage season. In terms of flow and hydraulic criteria, we are largely focused um, on upstream migration of, of steelhead adults right now so that they can reach the upper watershed for spawning. Uh, we're also concerned, of course, about safe juvenile passage downstream. But the juveniles tend to go more passively with, with higher flows downstream. And so because of the existing channel characteristics, uh, the first challenge is really establishing suitable uh, hydraulic conditions that will allow adults to migrate upstream to the upper watersheds. Um, and this project is a little bit different than some other fish passage projects in that we are trying to restore passage in the four part point eight mile reach and, and ultimately in the entire river system rather than just restore passage at a specific barrier like a, a dam or a road crossing. So a fish will be in the channel for an extended period of time and part of the biological work is to, to estimate the migration rates. Uh, and because of they'll be in the channel for an extended uh, time period, they are likely to experience variable hydrologic conditions because of their because of the flashy nature of the of the watershed's hydrology. So it's important to consider that variability that fish will encounter on the way from the ocean to the upper watershed, and what that means with respect to the need for holding and resting areas 
and features to prevent stranding as, as flows go up or down. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, with our primary objective, our primary ob objective is to provide hydraulic conditions that uh, give passage for adult and juvenile steelhead trout in a, in a flow window that to the extent possible uh, mimics natural conditions that existed historically. And to do that, we might consider more than one uh, type of, of passage design. Uh, so some, some designs might consider the full width of the channel or providing passage in a, a portion of the width or channel or in particular places where we have a high level of constraint, say at bridges or a drop in channel grade, uh, more structural solutions or um, uh, bypass solutions might be considered. Uh, and it's, it's important for each of those passage types to consider the implications, uh, the long-term implications for operations and, and maintenance uh, of the flood control channel with fish passage in, included. Uh, passage design within the project uh, could vary by reach uh, or, or segment of, of channel, but some consistency is, is desirable so that we um, reduce the potential for stranding or delay. Uh, so, for example, if we have one channel segment that, that allows fish passage at a higher flow than an adjacent channel segment, some delay could occur at that, at that change, and that affects the overall uh, passage success. So even though our opportunities and constraints for improving passage might vary uh, from place to place in our project reach, we want to maintain some consistency in design criteria for fish passage. Uh, the, the design concepts um, will be evaluated quantitatively. Um, so we'll have uh, quantitative metrics like minimum depth and maximum velocity and we'll talk quite a bit more about that during the presentation but to some degree they may also be evaluated qualitatively uh, so things like uh, better holding water for and cover for protection multiple versus single passage routes uh, co uh, connectivity for other aquatic species uh, sustainability and susceptibility problems due to sediment or debris and the need for maintenance. Those are our metrics that might be evaluated qualitatively. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is just an example of um, design criteria and targets from another project. This is for the Arroyo Trabuco at Interstate 5. And uh, these criteria are based on guidance from National Marine Fishery Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they really need to be developed for a particular type of, of passage design. And in this case, it was a, a rough and channel style of, of passage design. Uh, but it starts with uh, design flows, a minimum and maximum flows by life stage uh, uh, for the particular project area and includes physical and hydraulic criteria. So things like maximum slopes, maximum vertical drops, maximum links for any segments that require a, a higher swimming speed or a, a burst swimming speed, maximum velocity, minimum depths, and usually some metrics for turbulence or dissipation of energy. So we're just at, at the beginning of developing criteria like this for the, the LA River. And the first step is looking at that hydrology of the project area and potential passage windows in terms of flow. And Johannes is going to cover that subject next. Thanks, Ed. Um, so as AJ mentioned previously, obviously the LA River has changed a lot through time. Uh, you know, some of the major hydrologic alterations we've seen in the basin include uh, inputs and outputs through diversions and transbasin diversions. Um, the channel even just going concrete disconnects it completely from groundwater except for a few locations. Urbanization in the watershed obviously has increased flows. Um, but in general, you know, the LA River has always been a flashy system um, and it remains flashy, but in an altered type of way, which I'll kind of describe it a little bit uh, here. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Sam. 
So uh, as Ed mentioned, you know, we really need to come up with this flow windows that we're going to look at for fish passage. So the first kind of question we need to ask ourselves, okay, well, what, what period of record, what's, what's reflective of the current hydrologic regime we see right now? Um, and so as AJ also mentioned, you know, this period, 1985, 1986 to 2019, we know that now all the wastewater treatment plants are online. Dams have been in place, urbanization's kind of been there for a long time, transportation diversion. So we've kind of had this maybe settled um, kind of hydrologic regime right now. So we, we picked the period 1985 to 2019 for that. And now the question is, what gauge do we use? So on the map, you know, they, it's hard to see, but the red is our project area and they're just downstream of project area. There is a gauge, the LA River of Firestone. Unfortunately, though, all the data there is kind of unreliable and that gauge was taken offline in 2014. So we kind of had to start thinking about, okay, well, what flow data are we going to use? Um, so we combined a couple different gauges. There's one upstream of Project Reach, which is just the LA River above the Royal Seco. We took that and we added in the Royal Seco flows into it, which that gauge is below Devil's Gate Dam. Um, and then we also took the gauge below, which is the LA River at Wardlow, and we subtracted out the Rio Hondo tributary coming in. But both of those, um, there are some issues. The one above still underestimates the amount of flow through our project area because the Arroyo Seco gauge is so high up on the, in that watershed that we miss all of the inputs from Pasadena from urbanization. And then the one downstream, basically, even, even though we took out the Rio Hondo, it includes all of Los Angeles urbanization. So it's one underestimates flow and one overestimates flow. So we kind of took a straight average, which I'll show later. Next slide, please. So just in general, like I mentioned, this is just a kind of uh, uh, average hydrograph from a, the, during the winter season from December to June. Um, I, the main takeaways from this are you can see the storm events in an average year are still pretty quick up and down. You can get above 30,000 CFS and back down within, you know, two, three days. Some events are even shorter. Um, and the other thing to notice, too, is the, the base flows are all around 100 CFS. So you can really see that wastewater input on the hydrograph that AJ was mentioning. So those are the kind of two things to look at that this still is a really flashy system and brings up the point of uh, how are fish going to move through this system. Next slide. So um, the main place we got to start is we got to define this this window. You know, we need to find a high uh, a high flow value that we're going to design for. Um, and a lot of ways to do this, you can kind of in the table, you can see one way is to take the 50% of the Q2. This data is based on hourly data. And there is a big difference between hourly and daily data on this uh, system because of how flashy it is. So you can see that value is almost 15,000 CFS. And then the other values, the 1% exceedances are based on daily mean values. And those are more around 8,000 and 4,000. So these are different ways to try to define, okay, what's this highest flow value that we're gonna design up to? Um, and generally, you know, some systems you have a little more agreeance on those values. These ones are really spread out. So we have to dig a little deeper. So next slide. So what we did here, the green, the red, and the orange lines, those are those values we pulled out. So the 15,000, the 8,000, and roughly the 5,000 CFS. So if you look here, um, the, the hydrograph lines that go above those color lines would not be included in the design. Um, ones below would be captured within our design. Uh, so here we have a wet year. Wet, so I, we basically looked at a wet year, an average year, and a dry year. So I'll take you through all of those. So the wet year conditions, you can see if we just designed to that orange line, we would maybe miss out some actual decent storm event durations that would have steelhead movement through it. So maybe going to that low, that orange line, maybe we're missing some things. But if we go to the next slide, during the dry year, you can see, you know, we, we might not even have fish passage through here. It's hard to say, you know. So in a dry year, all of those flow values are include all the flows. So we would cover it if there was fish passage during a dry year. Next slide. Finally, in the average year, this is the same hydrograph I showed you before, you know, in a typical average year, you can see that the green line, you know, captures everything. But if you go all the way down to the orange line, what's above the orange line are some really high up and down peaks. You know, they happen really quickly. So the reason why we want to, you know, kind of just pick this higher level flow and maybe not just go with the highest is because it gets really hard to find the right depth and, and keep the velocities low when you're at these higher, higher flow values. So you really need to find a value that can kind of work for fish passage, but also captures most of the flows. So um, if you go to the next slide, these are what we kind of end up going with. Based on what we saw, you know, we find that that 
the high flow fish patches, that 4,664 CFS line does capture almost all the flows through there. It's the 1%. So, you know, we were capturing 99% of flows with that. Um, so we feel pretty comfortable with that. We don't feel like we gain much by going up to that higher 15,000 CFS flow value. And if you look in this uh, table down here, this is basically just a summary of what we did. So the red column on the left is that Firestone gauge. We just, we kept that in an analysis just to make sure that we weren't missing anything, but we kind of ignored that. And then the green is the design average. Those are the ones we ended up going with in the middle. The one on the left and the one on the right are the combination of the gauges. The one on the right overestimates the one on the left uh, underestimates. So we ended up taking a straight average. We did consider drainage area stuff, but with how altered the, the system is, we just felt like straight average would probably be just as good. Um, so the only other things to really consider uh, with uh, flows is, okay, what about the base flows? How, how are they going to move? And like AJ alluded to, moving at that 100 CFS, you know, 121 to 70 CFS, like I kind of called out, if Steelhead do move to that, then that's going to be really important because of how flashy the system is. And then the only other thing to consider is how does climate change going to impact flows on the LA River and also if there is a reduction in wastewater treatment plant based flows because of recycling water and things like that, would this hurt steelhead passage moving into the future? So these are things we're still trying to get answers to. Next slide. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so at this time, thank you. We're going to pause for uh, discussion. And uh, we did have um, some really good questions from Sabrina that came in that I think AJ and Ed can address uh, on the fishery side. And then we, we also want to just keep this open um, to reflect on uh, the discussion that AJ, Ed, and Johannes brought to us regarding um, the sealhead story, uh, the design targets, hydrology, and um, how these will uh, be very important for looking at steelhead recovery. So before we get into the opportunities and constraints, bigger picture water needs um, and related projects, we're going to take about um, looks like 10 minutes um, to, to just have this open discussion time. So let's see. Why don't we start with um, Sabrina had a question. Um, about the limiting factors analysis. And um, AJ, I think you might have seen this by now, but um, she's asking yes. about uh, addressing other limiting factors. So if you could. Yeah. So, Sabrina, thanks for the question. The question, just to repeat it for everyone's benefit, is um, the first one Do limiting factors include specifically connection to groundwater and springs, exotic species, and water quality and clarity? And the answer is yes, to the extent that we can uh, gather the information and make uh, reasonable hypotheses. Uh, we, we will be and are looking at those things. Um, maybe starting with water quality, we, we have looked at the available uh, suspended sediment data, which is collected again, I think it's at the Long Beach USGS gauge um, and some other water quality data. Um, looking at, you know, the concentrations of suspended sediment as well as some of the other um, pollutants in the river to see, um, you know, to what extent those may um, pose a problem, you know, a limiting factor for steelhead. Um, it's these, uh, these items, uh, water quality and clarity and groundwater in particular may not be things that we can specifically address as part of our design in the 4.8 mile reach. Um, exotic species, on the other hand, uh, we would hope that, um, you know, by providing conditions that are closer to what um, steelhead need and what they evolved with, um, and keeping these, you know, exotic species in mind because they are potential predators on steelhead, especially juveniles, um, we would hope to that our designs you know do address these potential limiting factors and, and essentially limit habitat suitability i don't think we can hope to completely eliminate suitable habitat for exotic species because they've got a, a pretty strong hold in the la river as you know yeah great so, i want oh, go ahead sorry i wanted to allow eric stein a chance to 
talk about the LA River Environmental Flows Project, which will also provide an analysis of migration flows. Um, but just right before we go to Eric, um, Sabrina, does that address your question or should we come back to you? I think it does. Um, I did all, also have that question about velocity barriers and not just sort of the upper high velocity points that were on the barriers map. Right. But sort of that, you know, combination of maybe, a, you know, a, a sub yes. barrier flow times the distance, the metabolic, you know, yeah. barrier yeah. of distance. No, that's a great question, Sabrina, and we have been grappling with that. So thanks. Thanks for asking this one. Um, so essentially, um, you know, not only just velocity or, um, you know, limited depth, but um, what, what kind of distance would the fish have to um, swim through at a, a velocity that could be um, at or beyond their, you know, their typical swimming speed and their typical ability to, to, to move upstream. And, you know, this has to do also with, um, you know, the, the swimming ability of the fish, which we've looked at um, in a lot of detail. And also the, you know, the duration of the storm flows and the distance. So there's multiple factors at play here. And we, we have considered that. And, and we are recognizing that um, in all likelihood, um, because of the high velocities in unaltered sections of the concrete channel, I should say, in the concrete channel that would not be restored, um, downstream of our project reach, for example, um, and the fact that, you know, based on the, the fish's swimming speed and um, the duration of the storms, it's likely that they would, you know, an adult steelhead entering the LA River would need one or two, perhaps, um, resting areas, holding areas, even in the reach between the ocean and our design reach, um, just because the distance, like you pointed yeah. out, is likely to be uh, prohibitive. Great. Okay, let's let's go to um, Eric Stein, and then uh, I know he has to drop off soon. And then Christine Medic had a good question that I think AJ and Nathan and Ed can address regarding a uh, range of flows. So Eric, if you're available, could you talk about the e-flows? Yeah, thanks, Wendy. I'll, I'll keep this really short because I know we're limited on time. But I also just wanted to um, make a comment on that last discussion um, and just maybe um, comment or ask that I know that there are some there's some work going on in um, the northern part of the state and places like the South Fork Eel in particular where they're developing models to look at metabolic costs associated with migration. And so if you haven't looked at the work on the South Fork Eel, there may be some good tools you can draw from in terms of this issue of metabolic costs, you know, relative to velocities and things like that. So that might be something worth seeing if it can be adapted for your use down here. Um, the other thing, just get, most of many of you on the phone are aware, so I'll just mention real quickly that we've been coordinating with Wendy and the Stillwater team um, in our um, project looking at environmental flows on the LA River. So um, I think some of the tools that are coming out of that in terms of the more detailed hydrology and hydraulic modeling and um, the scenario analysis for reduced wastewater discharge and some of the probability-based um, habitat suitability models um, will um, potentially provide some additional insights, you know, beyond sort of minimum flows or design flows um, that might inform some of the analysis here. So I know a lot of the folks on the phone are aware of that, and I just wanted to um, let folks know that we're coordinating closely with the Stillwater team on the tools so that um, all the work can be integrated to, you know, inform the overall analysis. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Great. Uh, let's have, let's see, Christine had a question, Chris Medic, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, about a uh, range of flows and capturing that in our design approach. Um, so let's see, Johannes, it looks like you're replying. Yeah, yeah, just quickly, I, I should have been more explicit. You just are, you try to find that highest flow value and then everything below that you would ideally be providing fish passage for. So you're 
your last reply is is spot on. And this will uh, when Travis talks about our modeling, you'll see that we did uh, do a bunch of different flows within that flow range from forty six hundred down. Chris, did you yep. want to comment further? Looks like she's she's got it. OK, <laughs> so it's intended to provide migration at all flows below 4660. That's her follow up question. Yes, yes, yeah, that's correct. Correct. Great. OK, other other questions. Uh, we still have more time to to hear questions, comments, reactions. OK, sounds pretty quiet. Uh, I, I did have one other question. Sure. Um, yeah. And I think it was just a matter of what what data you showed on slides, but just to make sure. Um, I was wondering with um, some of the historic versus current comparisons, if you were closely taking a look at data from, and I don't know what year it changed, but when um, DWP changed their vegetation management policies such that um, sort of sandbars and islands may have expanded and contracted. Although, forgive me if I'm not, if that's not relevant to the project area. Um, Sabrina, where where is it that you um, recall that type of data being available in, in the watershed? Oh, um, I was just thinking of, you know, you were showing some of your um, uh, archival photo analysis. Right. And just making sure, I'm not sure at what date and Wendy may know offhand, um, the vegetation management policies changed. Mm. Because at one point they were kind of, you know, there was a policy in some areas of kind of scraping vegetation clear. And so you'd lose built up sandbars and islands. And then that changed. And, um, you know, at that point, some of those physical structures may have expanded beyond, maybe just beyond some of the soft bottom reaches. I'm not sure, but I would expect that um, topography, in stream sort of topography would have changed. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I haven't come across any data like that but it would be it would be interesting to look at um especially if um if the policy changed you know prior to steelhead becoming extirpated from the watershed oh, but it sounds like it was no, probably no no i'm talking about much more recent that yeah was, i, I figured okay in the thousands in the all right but what yeah. you might have seen is that some historical structure returned hmm. you know i was just noticing that you know in stream um there were some areas you had marked off as islands and bars. Right. Yeah. And those. I think not those, Yeah. I think what you're um, referring to is we we tried to trace the um, you know the essentially the route of the main channel, the primary right. flow, in the both the Arroyo Seco and the main stem in those historical photos, and uh, yeah, it would be really really interesting to see how things have changed in terms of structure and vegetation in the channel. But honestly, our uh, aerial photo historical analysis was n not done at that sort of level of resolution in terms of looking, you know, year to year to year to year. We just kind of started, we just kind of looked at um, snapshots that were representative of, of major periods of, of change. Okay, I'm going to pause right here and, and say we're going to have another opportunity for questions in about an hour. But right now we'd like to get into the concepts um, and opportunities and constraints. So um, Isaac will lead off and then get into we'll get into bigger picture water needs with June. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the IFR, Army Corps and related projects. And then we'll have another uh, moment after that, I think. So go ahead, Isaac. OK, thanks, everyone. Um, so. Looking at the opportunities and constraints, um, really in this map here across the 4.8 miles, um, recognizing that this is the urban core of the city and there are a lot of related plans, some some very um, compatible with Steelhead, the Arbor and Lower LA River revitalization plan. 
um, we're looking at, so we're trying to inventory all these um, these various pieces and and figure out locations um, that 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 we're, where we need to respond to them. Um, looking at the metro uh, um, access plan, they've 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 identified many access locations along this corridor, um, and so so we're trying to you know anticipate and respond to to these as as as, um, as appropriate as we lay out. Um, individual design treatments along this 4.8 miles. So the next slide we've got a, a these are these are the key kind of opportunities and constraints layers that we're collecting uh, bridges and barriers uh, looking at the wall morphology uh, maintenance access um, which there's really only one at the very top of the reach and one below. Um, we'll be looking at freeboard uh, as a potential uh, indicator of, of flood implications like Metro recently did for their um, their river path project. Um, we've got the river path project alternatives. Um, those There's three alternatives there that we'll be looking at and including various access points and potential modifications to the walls. Um, major projects down to, uh, interface. So, you know, there, there have been many visions plans, designs at various stages of development through this corridor and, and how, how should the project kind of respond to these major pro potential major projects. The downtown design dialogues effort <clears throat> from like a couple years ago um, is one that we've collected and we're looking at those locations. Um, on the right then looking at more on the opportunities end, how, you know, how can we connect with parks that are being planned or existing parks to so that the project can um, improve connectivity for both people and nature. Um, drainage and tributaries, we have numerous, you know, small and fairly decent sized tributaries entering through this reach and how can those confluences be become part of the Steelhead Passage, uh, ideally benefit beneficially and and how do future improvements in water quality coming from those tributaries with with Measure W and a lot of the big projects going on, um, how does that interface? Uh, we've got some urban biodiversity layers from LA San, uh, tree canopy layers, and of course land use. And then even how 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 can we look at what what this historically was, the historic ecology through this reach? And we know the river was was bumping up against some higher terrain on the the east bank, and that probably had naturally had implications for steelhead. So maybe we can respond to that in some way. And uh, with that, I'll pass it to June. Hi, this is June. So the LA River uh, drains from about watershed of 800 square miles um, size of watershed. And then uh, looking at this picture, there's many water, large size water uh, storage and conveyance facilities throughout the watershed, uh, including the main stamps of LA River, San Gabriel River and tributaries, and also the upper uh, reservoirs and, and dams. So uh, we see that the water are two watershed goals. Uh, one is to develop and maintain a sustainable water supply and ecosystems, and also uh, efficiently manage the risk of flood hazards. And then there, I think there are many uh, potential options and we can explore to achieve these objectives. Next slide. So about 20 years ago, uh, LA County, uh, with the support from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, completed a LACTA LA River alternative study. And the goal of that study was actually looking at the opportunities to increase flood control in the long downstream of the LA River. So during that study, the uh, there are a whole bunch of alternatives were looked at it, uh, which included uh, reoperation and modification of the dams and reservoirs which included the Hanson, Sepulveda, and the Widow Narrows uh, reservoirs. And that study also looked at additional storages, water storages um, like uh, Tohunga and Pocoyama spreading grounds. And these, uh, these options or these alternatives were shown um, by hydrological models uh, that they will have positive results or positive effects in attenuating floods in the LA River. Uh, because of increased uh, water storage and modified the flow release operations. Uh, we can uh, uh, revisit some of those options and to capture and store more water. 
and at the same time help to uh, um, attenuate peaks of flood flows in the, uh, in the lower reaches of the LA River. Um, downstream along the L LA River, as you can see from the left picture, uh, Taylor Yard and Peaky Backyards are two major sites uh, that were proposed by the LA River Ecosystems Restoration Project for Habitat and Wetland Parks. Uh, Taylor Yard has about 80 acres surface area and Peaky Backyard has about 110 acres and their approximate location to the LA River Project Reach um, can potentially make them a good candidates to provide additional convenience and additional water storage um, so they can augment water flows to the channel during fish migration season and also uh, potentially provide uh, flood risk reductions downstream. I'll get back to you, Wendy. Great. So in the opportunities and constraints for this project, we are focused on aligning with the Army Corps and City of LA, LA River Ecosystem Restoration wow. Project. Um, and this, this project does easily fit into that framework, um, especially the Arbor Reach. And um, so in this slide, we've highlighted um, some of those key themes. So basically the 4.8 mile pilot project reach does overlap with the IFRs reaches seven, Arroyo Seco, you can see that, and eight uh, where Piggy Backyard is. And so river um, modification to the existing channel um, is, is included in the final IFR um, with specific um, guidance. And so, the concepts that we are developing for fish passage are intended to be completely consistent with the ecosystem restoration project. So the channel adjacent to LATC would be, this is language uh, from the final IFR, would be changed from concrete to soft bottom to support freshwater marsh and aquatic habitat. The reach would also be widened. So this is something that needs to be further um, studied and analyzed. And that's part of our project um, is to look at that. Um, also measures would increase would create in channel diversity and hit or draw uh, to support further passage of wildlife, including aquatic and native fish, uh, such as native fish. And so these measures could include use of anchored boulders, and a new meandering low flow channel in the existing concrete. Next slide. So just to summarize this segment, um, we've been looking at um, ways to, to um, implement uh, these adopted plans and um, other things and really just reflecting on um, uh, the bigger picture of water needs and opportunities as June described, uh, we're really looking at multiple benefits and spatial scales presented by Isaac. Um, this, this translates to you know, multiple layers of related planning and projects that really make up the planning canvas for fish passage and this pilot project as well as future pilots um, in an integrated and targeted approach. So, you know, the vision for, for LA is, is very, um, very clear that uh, ecosystem restoration and the Arroyo, um, you can see there on the left, revitalization of industrial areas through downtown is also a priority. You can see that on the right. Um, Insized bike path access with Metro's LAR path. You can see that on the right as well. So access is really important um, for our communities. And um, as Isaac mentioned, the downtown design dialogue visions at 4th and 7th streets. So lots to think about and um, very important priorities. So next, let's move to 
um, the actual design concepts. And so Johannes, Nathan, and Travis will be sharing with us what those concepts are. And right about 1130, we'll have um, opportunities for more questions and discussion. Johannes? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Sam, you can move ahead, please. Yeah, so um, obviously a big part of the project is to actually get something done in the channel that would provide fish passage. So um, within our 4.8 miles, we have a lot of different kind of opportunities and also constraints within this section that we, you know, we didn't really feel like any one singular option would really work throughout the whole 4.8 miles. So we would have to kind of maybe go with uh, different concepts um, for different areas. So we came up with three different concepts that we're gonna share with you today. Um, we're calling them the maximum, the moderate, and the minimum. And these refer to kind of roughly how much we're gonna modify the existing channel but also about how much fish patches we could get with each of these different concepts. So um, these concepts can be applied throughout the 4.8 miles, you know, kind of depending on the different opportunities and strengths. For example, you know, maybe a minimum, which I'll show you is, is somewhere where we have bridges, you know, where you have piers that you can't move and you can't connect to the floodplain. Maximum might be somewhere like piggyback yard where we can actually do floodplain uh, connection and, and get a lot of more diversity in there. So we kind of have a, a range from minimum to maximum that I'll go through now. So next slide. So to start, we'll talk about this minimum fish passage. So uh, is the top kind of chart you can see there, that's the existing channel, which is obviously a concrete trapezoid. Um, the darker blue shade is what we're gonna cut down the channel. So this uh, impact on the existing channel does not go touch the banks at all. It's just working with a low flow channel on the inside and it's deepening that and kind of extending it a little bit. So two of the major criteria we need for fish passage are depth, and uh, slow velocities, right? So in order to get better depth, we're gonna cut a channel down um, and try to keep that low flow notch, um, that smaller little segment you see. So if you look at the A2, the second chart down, you can kind of see that light blues and the dashed line is existing grade. So you can see that newer uh, channel being cut down there and the new low flow channel is about that 20 foot channel. That's probably where most of our fish passage will have the approximate depth and uh, slower velocities and get fish passage through there. Now, what does that channel look like? It's still up for debate. You know, we're still considering natural bottom, whether it's cobble and boulder, or will we have to go something a little more artificial like concrete with grouted rocks in it for roughness. So we still have a lot to think about, but in general, we wanted to kind of take this geometry and now see if we can actually get fish passage with it and also think about flood risk as well, try not to increase flood risk. So this is kind of the minimum concept. We'll go to the next one, which is moderate. So here you can see we extended our impact on the existing channel a little bit more. We kind of went from the toe of the bank to toe of the bank. So obviously it's gonna cost a little bit more money, but hopefully we'll be able to provide a little more fish passage with touching the, tanner, the, touching the channel a little bit more. So here you can see we took that whole bottom of the channel, we now cut it down again. So we have an increase in depth and we have a compound channel in there as well. So almost three, like a, low, a wider low flow notch with a little inset bench. And then we have this higher, floodplain that would probably stay concrete. As you can see in B2, we'd have probably the bed would be concrete except for the low flow channel area. And um, we'll go to the next slide because we have three different air types. Yeah, here, this would be great. So again, what does that channel look like? And so in the middle, that low flow channel is now 60 foot wide as compared to 20 with the minimum. Hopefully we might be able to get away with more natural. Obviously there's uh, things to talk about like sediment maintenance, vegetation maintenance, you know, we're aware of all of these things, but at this point we just wanna see from a hydraulic perspective, can we actually get fish passage in these? So one, the natural bed alternative, maybe we get away with natural material, get some vegetation in there, which can be a great um, benefit just to the local ecosystem as well. Uh, the middle one is more of like a, a mix. Maybe we have some concrete, uh, concrete bed, but we have some planters in there to try to get some vegetation in a more controlled way, potentially. Um, and then finally, the last ones, maybe it just has to be a concrete bed and we're just sprouting roughness in there. You know, obviously this kind of has the least ecosystem benefits, but it might be a reality. So we're still trying to figure out the details in between, but we're, we're trying to get these channel geometries at work. So we go to the next slide. So finally, you know, this would be this would be what we'd love to do everywhere, right? But I, I don't think we can get away with this everywhere. This will be 
more in areas like Piggy Backyard where maybe there is potential to actually connect the floodplain wide out and get a nice riparian area, maybe some wetland habitat. So you can see in this channel modification, the existing channel on your left is that blue area and that whole, you know, we cut over another 500 feet of floodplain connection on the right. So uh, that whole area would be opened up for flow. Ideally, you'd get away with native bed material and you'd actually have a channel working. So uh, you can see in the conceptual bed design, there's a lot of vegetation in there, but the ecosystem benefits beyond just steelhead fish passage would be really uh, great here. And that's another problem with some maximum fish passage. Next slide. So if we go to the summary of what all these concepts are, like we mentioned before, so the minimum at the top is just kind of really trying to find this new low flow notch. It can hopefully fit within bridge piers, you know, so maybe we use it there, but maybe we have to use it in other areas as well. Something in the moderate goes a little bit in between. Maybe we still have some of these con concrete benches where we can have pedestrian trails, stuff like that, try to incorporate some of the other projects that are going on. And then finally, we have the maximum, which I think we'd all love to see on the LA River, but how realistic, where, it just depends. So that's what we have for the concepts, I believe. Next slide. Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. This is Nathan. So I wanna talk about some examples of modeling tools, such as 2D numerical modeling, physical modeling, and then give some highlights from a research study I did last year for the Bureau of Reclamation um, Research Program. So this figure is from the study and there's a report last year if you wanna look into it more. But basically I developed 13 different concepts, including the existing channel. So these are options for modifying the existing low flow notch, cutting some type of low flow channel into the concrete. So for all these concepts, I used a 2D model, looked at depth and velocity fish criteria. And you can see there's a range of things like geometry seven is a meandering low flow channel that has pools and riffles. Geometry nine uses that same meandering low flow channel that adds these flow deflectors out on the floodplain. And then something like geometry 13 has a two stage low flow channel now with bars and islands. So what I found using the, the 2D model and the fish passage criteria at low flows being le less than about two to 300 CFS, they all worked well. All you really need at those low flows is some type of roughened and deeper low flow channel. So it doesn't have to be too complex, but you're basically just looking for um, enough depth at those lower flows. But as we get into higher flows, some of these alternatives started to work better than others. So medium flows from about 300 CFS up to about 1000 CFS, that geometry 13 worked really well. It performed the best. The reason being it's a little bit larger low flow channel and it's got more complexity with the bars and islands. And as we increase the first uh, flows further up into the 2000 to 4000 CF range, that geometry nine worked the best with the floodplain deflectors, and that was because velocities get too high in the low flow channel. So you need some other type of feature to um, create a, an obstruction to slow down the velocity. So then um, one more thing to look at here is geometry 12. That's a, a pool riffle low flow channel with boulder clusters. And then if you move to the next slide, we took that concept and constructed a physical model in our lab here at Bureau of Reclamation in Denver. So on the right, you see the scaled physical model. So this was scaled from a, a low flow channel that would be about 60 feet wide and two feet deep. And the reason for doing this is then we could bring in boulders, um, different configurations into this physical model and collect detailed data. So if you go to the next slide, here's an example of some of the configurations we tested. We looked at four different types of boulders ranging from a single boulder, um, triangular clusters with three boulders and then diamond clusters with four boulders. And then we arranged them in different densities, different configurations, measured de depth and velocity, and we were able to compare the performance of some of these boulder clusters. Next slide. And a reason for doing the physical model, which you see on the left, um, you can make it look you know, very similar to what you might see in a natural river, but that natural river on the right you're not gonna be able to go out there, move things around. You're not gonna be um, have easy access necessarily to collecting 
data such as detailed flow and velocity measurements. It's a much more um, time intensive process. It may not be safe during high flows, so you just have a lot of challenges when looking at multiple configurations and collecting data in a natural river, whereas the physical model on the left, you can see we can just pick those rocks up, moving them around very quickly, observe the flow field visually, go in there with our velocity probe and take measurements. So it's nice to have this scaled physical model for testing alternatives and taking detailed measurements. OK, next slide. So on this one, you can just see a comparison between the physical model on the top. It's seeded with these white styrofoam particles, so you can see where the flow is going. So you can see the flow accelerates around the edge of the boulders, and then there's a slack water zone behind the boulders, and that compares very well to the 2D numerical model, which you see on the bottom, with the blue areas being the slower velocity. So these are areas where the fish, as they're swimming up, could possibly take refuge or hide behind these boulders to get into some slower velocity zones. Next slide. And then now transitioning a little bit from those previous images were from the 2019 research study. Now as we move into our current design process, one thing we wanted to look at is what's going on in the soft bottom section. So this area you can see the transition just above Arroyo Seco from the soft bottom with vegetation into the concrete line bottom. And we wanted to look at what are the fish passage characteristics in this soft bottom section? Do we have suitable, suitable depth and velocity there? And what's the role of this heavy vegetation that you see in the image? So going from the image on the left to the um, image in the center, you can see this roughness mapping zone. So the different levels of vegetation are assigned to what's known as a Manning's N value, which quantifies the roughness or the resistance of flow for a, your hydraulic model. And you can see it's an order of magnitude range and roughness from a smooth concrete channel downstream 0 0.014 up to this dense vegetation of 0.11. And then if you look over at the panel on the right, this is a velocity map and it pretty much mirrors the roughness zone. So our areas of dense, and this is at a two-year flow, by the way, about 21,000 CFS. So all the um, all the vegetated bars are inundated with flow, but this dense vegetation creates roughness, which creates the low velocity shown in blue on that figure and on the right, whereas your areas in red are at the toe of your concrete slope. And what Sam's pointing there to, um, is at the toe of your concrete slope, you have 20 to 30 feet per second of velocity compared to the heavy vegetation zones are about four to five feet per second. So this order of magnitude change in roughness has a huge influence on your flow velocity and therefore a huge influence on fish passage. Next slide. And this image compares three different flow rates going from a base flow of around 120 CFS up to what we're looking at our high edge, high end of the fish passage flow window at 4660. In the lower right, you can see the, the color ramp is the velocity scale. All the scales are the same for those three figures, so blue would be less than about three feet per second. Green and yellow would be four to six feet per second. Orange would be about eight feet per second, and then red would be 10 to 12 feet per second. So at low, at low flows, you can see it's all relatively lo low velocity. You have no problems with velocity at low flow in the soft bottom section. You may have some problems with depth. We did find some areas at this flow less than one foot of depth, especially when flow starts to split. So that's something um, to look at for the soft bottom section. But velocity is fine because of that roughness as you move into the middle panel at 830 CFS and then to the right at 4660. You see this progressive increase in velocity but you can still see that influence of vegetation where on the right you see high velocity along the edge of the channel of the concrete bank, but you see low velocity over the dense vegetation. And then one more thing to point out at the bottom of that figure at 4660, I've labeled the transition into the concrete section and it's all this monotonic zone of red high velocity 13 to 15 feet per second. So this is a challenge in design. We've got a constriction and we've got a a transition to a smooth channel. So currently something like that is probably not going to be passable. Okay, next 
slide here. I think we may have some videos now. So this is an animation of velocity using that same scale um, up to 12 feet per second. And this is a two day hydrograph from February 2010, like Johanna showed. And you'll see as flows are starting to come up now, they're going to get up to close to 30,000 CFS. So this would be between a two year flow and a five year flow. Flows are starting to increase right there is close to 20 to 30,000 CFS. And then you can see it's a quick peak and then flows are dropping again now. Lower velocity back down to a, a base flow. So as we're looking at these different flow windows, we need to consider this transition from low to high flow during these quick hydrographs, the quick storms that come through. And then this next one, I've got the same hydrograph, so it's a two day period. You can actually see it in the upper right hand corner of the time. But now this is near the Arroyo Seco. And again, it's going to get up to this 25 to 30,000 CFS. And this is all concrete, all um, very high velocity, well up into the 20 to 30 feet per second range. So as we're looking at fish passage into the Arroyo, this confluence is also something that eventually will have to be addressed for fish to get from the main stem up to the Arroyo Seco. And now with flows dropping down, you still have high velocities in that low flow concrete notch and then lower velocities when flows are spreading out. And this is a constant flow around 4000 CFS, but those white lines are what we call streamlined. So you can just see how the flows from the Arroyo are connecting to the main stem as everything's getting swept downstream. So it's the same color ramp, your darker red is the higher velocity. And then those white lines are, uh, it's a particle tracing just showing the streamlines or the, the paths that the flow may take. Okay, and then the last one we have here, this is from the um, floodplain deflector geometry design concept. So what you can see here is these deflectors that stick out from the bank cause these nice backwater zones or they cause these nice eddy zones where flow is gonna be accelerating around the tip of the structure as shown by the, the red, the high velocity, but everything in blue would be less than about three feet per second. And that's still over the top of concrete, but by creating these obstructions, we can contract and expand the flow to create these eddies and these slow velocity zones. Um, okay, I think that's all I was gonna say there. So just wrapping up this section, a 2D model is a good tool because it shows you both lateral and longitudinal variability for depth and velocity. So you can see how velocity changes as a function of roughness, for example. You can see the streamlines. You can see the influence of some of these obstructions that you might put into the flow to create a refuge of slower velocity area for fish. And then we also did a physical model to look at some of those boulder configurations. And uh, all the details are in the final report. You see the cover page there on the screen of the final report. OK, so now we're starting to move into a little more detail on our design concepts and basically starting with the 1D model for now. And then eventually we'll start applying more of those advanced tools such as the, the 2D model. Um, you can go to the next slide. but. Just want to take a step back and think about the approach. And I think we have to start by acknowledging and by being direct about the hydraulics we're dealing with here because we do have some competing hydraulic characteristics between these two goals of fish passage and flood protection. And the reason is that the existing channel was really just designed for conveyance and flood protection. So it's very uniform, very smooth, confined high velocity. So all of these things are good for flow conveyance, but they cause high velocity, which is bad or it's limiting for fish passages. The, the velocity is basically too high for fish to move around without just getting swept downstream. So in order to achieve fish passage, we do have to reduce the velocity. And one way of doing that is adding roughness. 
and on its own, just adding roughness, it reduces velocity, but it would also increase the flood stage unless you have a corresponding increase to the channel area. So that kind of shows the interplay between those two goals that to add roughness to reduce velocity, but to maintain flood protection, we do have to increase the area of the channel, meaning we have to make the channel wider and deeper. But the more the channel area is increased, it increases the cost and complexity. And then we not also need to consider constraints like the bridges, piers and utilities are constraints for both width and depth. And then we also have width constraints like railroad tracks, land use, land acquisition. If we can't acquire more land next to the channel, we can't make it wider. You know, there's a limit to how deep we can go because we also need to connect to upstream and downstream reaches. We're just looking at this 4.8 mile reach. We can't create a waterfall at the upstream end or a pond at the downstream end. It's all got to be connected. So we do have some constraints we're dealing with. But in general, the wider you can make the channel, it's going to provide more opportunities, especially at higher flows. And not only for fish passage, but other ecosystem benefits as well. The wider channel will give you a better opportunity for natural substrate, native vegetation, and overall um, habitat improvements. And then as far as flood protection, what we've been evaluating so far is a, either a rise or a no rise, basically a change to water surface elevation. But another, um, another comprehensive approach would be to look at freeboard. So how much room do we have from the water surface to the top of the channel? So we can look at both of those conditions to better understand level of flood protection as we move forward in the design. OK, then next slide. And then just um, to be a little more visual, I created a graph with a lot of those concepts. But what I want to show in this graph is for both fish passage and flood protection, it's a continuum. It's not necessarily just binary, whether you have it or you don't. There's kind of this range based on roughness. So the graph on the left shows that in general, the more you increase roughness, the more you can slow down velocity, which improves fish passage, but it decreases flood protection. And you may imagine the existing concrete line channel in our design reach would be at the left end of that spectrum, very smooth with good flood protection, but no fish passage. And then as you increase the roughness, you might imagine something like the existing soft bottom channel sections, which has lower velocities, better fish passage, but uh, less, less level of flood protection. And then what the graph on the right is showing is that if you increase the channel area, you can improve both fish passage and flood protection. But the, since we're already starting with this existing confined channel, the more you modify it, the more you make it bigger, it's going to increase the cost and it's going to increase the time and complexity. And if I were to merge those two graphs together, you'd have roughness and channel area both changing at the same time. That would allow you to maintain a constant high level flood protection at across the top, but also improving fish passage. So we kind of need eventually to decide with this group and get some input, but what are the constraints with how much we can increase the channel area and then what level of fish passage we're designing for? Because if we're constrained with our channel area, we're going to have a lower level of fish passage. The more we can increase the channel area, the more we can increase um, fish passage while maintaining flood protection. So that just shows kind of this interplay between the two main goals we're looking at. OK, I think that's always going to say there. So Travis can take over from here. OK, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go into uh, specifically a little bit more detail on the um, 1D design analyses that we've done so far to uh, create the concepts that we saw earlier. Uh, and just building on what Nathan was just talking about here, this figure sort of showing these three aspects of the design that we're funneling to have uh, an integrated design uh, for the project. Uh, Nathan mentioned, of course, the competing goals of flood risk and fish passage. Uh, and then we're also, of course, balancing uh, connectivity. Uh, and that could mean connectivity with all the other projects going on in the watershed, all the other studies and information we have, uh, as well as connecting to other important areas of habitat, 
such as the uh, soft bottom reach right upstream of our project reach, um, and as well as important tributaries like the Rio Seco, for instance, in our project reach. Uh, and then, of course, hopefully connectivity with the community as well. Uh, next slide. So I, I wanted to kind of take it back to the, the start here just to talk about sort of why we're here, uh, if you will, as far as uh, fist passage and um, the existing conditions in uh, the LA River and a lot of the LA River and specifically in our project reach. Um, and at most flow conditions, uh, there is no fist pat, there's not uh, fist passable flows in depths uh, within the uh, project reach. Um, and this uh, photo here, courtesy of Nathan, um, is showing a condition at low or base flow. Um, as you can see here, with this condition, uh, we have a limitation with having too low a depth uh, and as well too high a velocity. Um, and that velocity, even at this low flow, is uh, actually usually in a super critical flow state. Uh, and for, for those of you that aren't familiar with that uh, terminology, it's, it's basically uh, just a state of flow that characteristically has very low depth and very high velocities. Um, so partly why this is the case uh, is, as Nathan was talking about earlier, uh, quantifying the uh, roughness of the channel since the bed and banks of the channel are all concrete, has very low roughness or resistance to that flow to slow it down. Um, and um, following the uh, Army Corps study, uh, the concrete through this uh, project reach here is uh, a Manning's roughness value of 0.014, which is very low. Um, and the slope as well through the reach is 0.45%. Um, and for having a concrete channel, that's a relatively steep slope as well through the, uh, through the project reach. Um, so next slide, please. So diving a little bit more into the details of sort of looking at our channel design approach so far and really trying to have this balancing act between providing fist patches um, as well as um, maintaining uh, flood risk. Uh, as we were looking at earlier, we came up with three concepts sort of ranging from this minimum to maximum uh, that sort of correlates with the amount of fist passage that it uh, could achieve, um, as well as the uh, amount of disturbance it will take to get that. Um, and then so far, uh, as Nathan alluded to, uh, we just did simple analyses with a 1D model in the project reach. Um, for sake of simplicity, in a, in a 1D model, we can change the dimensions, the roughness of the channel um, very quickly um, and go through many iterations of that very quickly with the idea that we want to get a, um, a balance or a sensitivity on changing the dimensions and roughness uh, correlated to uh, what we can do for fist passage and then balancing act with flood risk as well. Um, so I, I, for this analysis, I use simplified cross section as well, which we'll see here in a minute. Um, but this table over here on your right uh, shows a little bit more uh, detail about these two uh, competing interests um, quantif quantified. Um, the flows that we're looking at uh, so far for the fish passage um, range from 25 CFS all the way up to this flow, maximum flow we were talking about earlier, the 4,660 um cfs um, but for flood risk so far uh as nathan was talking about uh we have been looking at flood risk as doing what's called the no rise analysis and um, basically all that means is just comparing a modeled existing condition 100 year water surface um to the uh, a new proposed 100 year water surface and um comparing them to show that you did not show a rise in the new proposed uh, design condition 100 year water surface. Uh, so that 100 year water uh, discharge in our reach is 109 CFS, which is several, several, just to put it in perspective, several orders of magnitude higher than what we're looking at for fist passage. Um, so the goals of these two, uh, looking at fist passage, so you're talking about earlier, uh, is really to maximize the depth for fist passage and minimize the velocity. Um, and for flood risk, it's in fact um, basically the opposite. We're trying to minimize depth and not necessarily trying to maximize velocity, but it's sort of a product that has to be done in order to minimize uh, the depth unless you uh, greatly increase the cross-sectional area as we showed in our maximum concept. Um, and for looking at the geometry of these two, 
Uh, for fist passage, we're really looking at focusing on uh, altering the low flow uh, and then secondary uh, floodplain benches in a compound channel for these 25 to 4,000 CFS. Um, and for flood risk, uh, in order to look at the not causing a rise in water surface, uh, we're looking at lowering the bed of the channel um, and as well as cre increasing the width of the channel and increasing that cross-sectional area. Um, and for roughness, uh, fish passage, you're trying to maximize the roughness and for flood risk, it's minimized. Uh, and then the flow regime, uh, again, for uh, this terminology is so we really do need um, subcritical flow conditions for fish passage um, and to maintain supercritical conditions um, during uh, the 100 year discharge, unless we have a large increase in cross sectional area, which we'll talk about more. And the, the subcritical condition is just the opposite of supercritical, where it's a flow state that has higher depth and lower velocities. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so just an overview of this um, simple 1D uh, hydraulic analysis we've done. Uh, over on the left is the plan form of the uh, model uh, with the cross sections. I just picked a generic area of our project reach. Uh, this is an example to run through some of this uh, sensitivity on geometry and roughness. Uh, the table over here on your right um, shows uh, the different flows we are looking at as well as roughness values. So the far left column of that shows the different descriptions of flows that um, Johannes were, was presenting earlier. Um, and we, we are arranging, we started at 25 CFS, which is just a, a generic guess, but um, as we know, there may be uh, decreased base flows um, uh, with recycling water in the future. So we wanted to look at just a really low flow just in case that might happen and just see what the conditions are at that flow. Uh, and this goes all the way up to that 1% exceedance, um, 4,000 CFS we were talking about earlier. Uh, we also uh, did some peak flows um, that we took from the uh, Army Corps study model um, up to the 100-year discharge shown there in red at the 109 CFS. Uh, so as we were talking about earlier there, the existing roughness for all of these flows <laughs> are uh, 0.014 over all concrete. Uh, which is very low. Um, and for our this analysis, closer to what we would want to do for the design, we uh, varied the roughness with depth um, with the idea that um, when you add roughness elements, as it'd be cobbles or boulders or such on the um, uh, bottom of the channel, uh, as flow increases, it starts washing out, uh, so to speak, the effect of that roughness and it decreases roughness. Um, ranging from, we have 0.07 at the lowest flow all the way up to uh, 0.03 at the 100-year uh, discharge. Although it's worth noting that, um, first of all, in the channel, um, with just cobbles and boulders and not the heavy vegetation as we saw from the soft bottom, we're not able really to get up to like the 0.11 roughness that was shown in the soft bottom reach. Um, uh, that you can get with natural vegetation, except maybe in our maximum concept uh, that we we'll have to look at that more, but that's a limitation. Um, and then all, all the way at the 100 year, um, 0.03 is still about twice the roughness of the existing condition. So there's limitations there as well, challenges. And uh, the slope was the same 0.45%. Okay, next slide. So before I go into the, uh, the outputs of this 1D um, analysis, I just wanted to point out a few things using this hydrograph again. This is similar to what Johannes presented on earlier. This is uh, an average year hydrograph for, uh, from uh, January to about March um, of typical time when peak flows occur in the LA, uh, LA River. Um, and again, you can see here as we are looking at it early, how, just how flashy the system is um, with flows going up from less than 100 to 30,000 and back down very quickly. Um, and the reason why I wanted to point this out um, is a couple. Uh, for this analysis so far and all the hydraulic um, that we've done is looking at these single flows ranging through um, 25 to 4,000. But in fact, of course, and um, that's very simplified compared to what's actually occurring out there. Uh, uh, flows are, in fact, uh, changing very rapidly um, during flood events, uh, and that will have to be looked at deeper. Uh, just something to keep in mind as we look at the results. Um, and, and as well, uh, since uh, another point from this is uh, in more natural conditions, uh, a steelhead may be 
uh, triggered at the end of one of these uh, flood events uh, to start migrating on up in the receding limb of the hydrograph here. And it, but as you see here, these hydrograph drops off extremely quickly, of course. So there's likely a chance that stillhead that would be migrating to the system uh, would be just to our maybe just to our project reach area uh, by the time the flood already went away. So what that what that means to us is that in um, this new in this altered system, it may be very important to try to provide fish passage at those base flows uh, in between these flood events for the fish. Um, uh, and as uh, yes, and, and as well as uh, of course providing holding areas within our project reach as well uh, in between the flood events. The next slide. OK, so um, just looking at the minimum concept here, uh, the figure over here on the right is just uh, an output from the 1D hydraulic model HECRAS. Um, it's just a cross section. Uh, it is vertically exaggerated for those who haven't seen these before. Uh, but this is just to show the simple uh, changes we are making to come up with these concepts. Um, on this figure, uh, the pink line there down at the bottom of the channel with the small low flow is the existing condition. Uh, and the black underneath it with the compound channel is the proposed condition. Uh, and again, the vertical walls and stuff aren't uh, what we're suggesting for the design. It's just um, for the sake of simplicity and changing uh, widths and roughnesses quickly in this uh, analysis. Uh, the red dotted lines there shows uh, the zone of increased roughness within this concept. Uh, so just in the low flow channel for the minimum concept, so between the two red dots there, uh, is where roughness is actually increased uh, for this concept. Uh, and then uh, the blue lines uh, further up is the 100 year water surface uh, elevation. Uh, there is a pink and a blue one, but they're right over each other because this was uh, getting right at a no rise condition between the existing and proposed. Uh, so with this, as we were talking about earlier, uh, this minimum uh, concept is just mostly concerning uh, altering the slow flow. Um, and from the simply modeling exercise, uh, we were able to get uh, fish passage up to the 830 CFS level with a no increase in water surface elevation. And for those interested uh, for this analysis, we were targeting um, about three to four feet per second for velocities and over a foot of depth for the for the depth. Um, so. And of course, that's lower than the 4,000 uh, CFS uh, high target that we have, and we will discuss that more later. But there is a lot of limitations with doing um, balancing uh, this the flood risk as well. Uh, the last bullet there shows just to uh, point out the second level of this, and and not just the amount of flow that we're getting with fish passage. It is also the basically the functional area. Uh, that we're able to achieve that's fish passable within the uh, current confines of the channel as well. So I just did a simple area that's um, the area of increased roughness on the ground there between the two red dots is 30, um, 30 square feet and uh, this minimum uh, concept. OK, next slide. Moving on to moderate. Um, as we saw earlier, we uh, lowered the entire bed out to the current um, bottom of the uh, channel banks uh, and also increase the roughness from just the low flow that was 20 feet across uh, out to uh, the compound channel as well that was 60 is 60 feet across uh, which increases that uh, area roughness to 120 uh, square feet uh, and with this concept uh, we're able to get fish passage up to the 2030 cfs so no increase in water surface but as you would notice here uh, in order to have a uh, no increase in water surface at the hunt here, you're uh, required to continue to cut down the channel further uh, in order to get that. Um, okay, so moving on to the next one. So this is the maximum concept we were looking at earlier. Uh, the pink line there shows the existing bank. Uh, and as we uh, showed earlier, um, basically in order to uh, get this uh, no increase in water surface um, at this level. Uh, we were at increased roughness across the entire channel. Uh, you have to uh, increase the width very drastically. Um, and this is uh, 500 feet from the edge of the channel bank. Um, and the, the reason for this is um, the water uh, at the 100 year uh, 
water surface flow, it goes through uh, a, a change in state of flow uh, called the hydraulic jump. And it goes from uh, subcritical flow, uh, sorry, it goes from supercritical flow to subcritical flow condition, which is a much higher depth and a lower velocity condition at the 100 year discharge. So in order to um, occupy that within uh, the channel and make up for that change in uh, rise in depth, uh, you're having to uh, drastically increase the uh, cross-sectional area for this. Uh, but with this concept, we do get uh, fish passage all the way through our criteria for 4,660 um, and uh, increase just this is area is just a, even in the channel here, but is 800 square feet. Uh, so next slide. So just to sum everything up, uh, I know this was a lot, uh, a lot uh, to, to bring in, but um, for the minimum, moderate, and maximum, uh, this chart over on the right is really it's a bunch of numbers, but it's really just for those who are interested in more depth here. Um, basically, I color coded this as uh, the blue numbers are where we uh, would likely have fish passage, uh, and the red is possibly likely not. Um, so as you see on the top of this uh, graph here, uh, the left column there shows the discharge. Um, and we are likely getting fish passes through the 830 CFS um, with no increase in water surface at the 100 year. Um, it could possibly be up to 2000 uh, just within the little channel uh, there. But there's some discussion to be had there. Um, and then for the moderate concept, we are getting up to the, the 2000. Uh, and then the maximum all the way through. So you can sort of see as as this uh, as we go through from the minimum to the maximum, we're essentially getting more blue and more areas of um, favorable fish passage uh, hydraulics. Um, and then over on the left here, you can see also relating that to um, the functional area that we achieve. Uh, the area for the minimum is 30 square feet up to 120, all the way up to 100, 800 square feet. So uh, in drastic improvements with the total area as well. Uh, so just in conclusion from this, just want to show that um, really having this, this balancing act between uh, fist passage uh, and flood risk, uh, uh, certainly with um, modeling flood risk as a uh, no rise uh, condition, uh, does present um, a very big challenge and a lot of constraints to what is possible out there uh, to get fish passage um, and for the design. Um, so looking forward to more discussion moving forward with that. Um, well, but that's all I got. Great, thank you. So at this time, we're going to pause for just open discussion and we have um, a few questions that came in and actually got resolved in the chat. Uh, one was from Sabrina regarding looking at some of the guidance from Walton and Metzger for ecological vector mosquito control. And um, there's some history there with Bruce Orr and uh, his prior work as well. So thank you, Sabrina. We have that report now that you provided. Thank you. Um, and then also another question came up from Metro, from Atali, uh, regarding uh, deepening the channel and um, involvement from the core and looking at that. And then also uh, a related question about getting the 2D model, which Nathan actually provided during the chat. So, um, so that's been resolved. And uh, to address the question, uh, Matali, about reactions to deepening the existing channel, uh, we do know that, you know, we are following the core's guidance in terms of uh, flood risk and um, recommendations from the IFR Alternative 20 design, which does involve, um, like we quoted earlier, uh, looking at areas where meandering channel, uh, deepening channel, widening channel um, are part of the uh, um, the design approach to be evaluated further. So, uh, so that is that is the conversation that we are um, entering into, and we'll continue to pursue to find um, good solutions together. 
Let's see. Does anyone? Okay, I see another message. Wendy, can I have a follow up question? Sure. Question, please? Yes. Uh, who are you coordinating? This is Natalie. Sorry about that. Um, who are you coordinating uh, on the core end? Yes. So some of them are on the phone right now, um, but we have core regulatory. Um, so working under Steve Estes with uh, Vanessa Navarro, um, and then Prio and Rafi in the Section 408. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then Tim Timothy uh, Fairbanks uh, with the hydraulics division, uh, and then we have operations and uh, operations and maintenance. So uh, I know Kelly's on the phone and, and many others. Um, so there, there's a whole host of folks uh, that we've been engaged with um, over the duration of this project. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so at this point, we have uh, seen concepts from minimum to maximum. We've seen modeling. We've seen some video of actual flow. Uh, at the uh, confluence of the Arroyo Seco and the soft bottom reach, uh, competing um, opportunities and, and goals with flood and fish. So we'd love to hear your reactions and thoughts uh, at this time. So does anyone want to, to share? <laughs> you can unmute. I, I do. Just as Lieutenant Colonel Pearson of the Corps of Engineers with the operations and uh, maintenance. Yes, hi. I work with Kelly, I work with Mike Turnitza, and uh, several others. And I'm actually the program manager for the Los Angeles County drainage area to include the Los Angeles River. Excellent. Um, my, my concerns. Um, I understand the ecological, um, uh, you know, good points about having these. My concerns are going to be operationally and for maintenance. Our budget is very limited, and you know, as we are right now, we have to maintain uh, 22 miles of the LA River. And uh, my concern is, I we won't have the funding available to maintain. The vegetation that it will require. Um, just a thought: um, How do you how do you plan to, or do you have that in your plan as to how to maintain the vegetation uh, requirements? In addition, there's uh, the added concern of uh, the homeless habitat, and I think increasing these areas basically just provides more habitat for uh, homeless individuals. And so it's another maintenance concern that we are facing actually throughout all of the LA River and uh, other areas in the dam. So just some things to consider. Thank you very much. Could you repeat your name for me one more time? Certainly. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Malia Pearson. I got that. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, we are uh, very much uh, focusing on operations and maintenance as being both, uh, you know, a fatal flaw if it's not done properly um, and financed properly, um, but also a critical success factor if it can be implemented properly. Um, in in partnership with um, the appropriate folks. There's no definitive agreement right now. Uh, we're just in the conceptual stage of trying to implement um, the, the fish passage uh, objectives as well as implement the IFR. So I think it's it's a continued conversation um, between the city, the Army Corps. Uh, flood, flood control, and um, other partners uh, can provide funding. Okay, 
Um, some other questions came up. Did you want to respond to that or? Is that... No, I, um, I was just going to say thank you um, for addressing you. those concerns. Yeah, that's a high priority. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few comments that came in from Christine, from Chris Medic, and then also Sabrina. So Chris is just asking about um, velocity and um, could there be velocity refuges within the channel that were less um, and things like behind embedded boulders or other velocity deflectors? And I know the answer is yes. Uh, yes, Wendy, I was just uh, just about to send uh, a response to that. Uh, sorry, I didn't get it out. Uh, yes, the, the 1D model that we did only considers cross-section average velocity since it's uh, one dimensional. But yes, in reality, it will uh, vary uh, across the cross-section and uh, through the water column and around boulders. Um, in, our, our, in our next steps, our uh, two-dimensional design model will be able to capture those effects a lot better. Uh, but for the 1D, um, those are just cross-section average, uh, not necessarily maximums. Um, just average velocities for the cross section. Great. Okay. And uh, Sabrina had a question. Yeah, and, and it may be a dumb question. So it was kind of a question for Nathan. In the 2D models, you, you talked about these velocity deflectors. I'm afraid I didn't have a sense of how high they are. Are, are they meant to be inundated at? Only at high flows, uh, give me a better idea of what the, they would look like. I think what I showed in that video, for example, was something like two to three feet high, but it really depends on yeah, obviously what the design flow is. And the more those structures are over topped, you're going to see less of an influence. So it's something like 4000 CFS out on the concrete bed. That's about the um, two to three feet high is about what the elevation of those are. So you can make them higher, it'll deflect water at higher flows, but it also have a bigger impact on flood stage. So that's kind of the trade off between the fish passage and the flood stage, but they don't really have to be that high, you know, a couple feet high will work at a lot of flows and same with the boulders. Those boulders might be something like three feet high um, sticking up above the channel bed and then the fish can also get closer to the bottom of the water column, which isn't going to really be shown in the modeling results, but you'll have lower velocities down near the bottom of the channel. OK, I, I admit I was also, you know, I, I think a lot about temperature issues and I was trying to figure out just from a design perspective, you know, I've, all of the challenges to providing additional shading in the river where there is are not um, vegetated banks. And just trying to think of if there was some way to add something, whether it's plants or it's something more um, constructed that would also provide shade and, and, and provide um, uh, cooling in, in summer and low flow conditions. But. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. We're thinking yep. the same and probably in combination with um, this integrated approach, looking, looking at um, access to the river, um, bridge crossings, uh, all kinds of proposals um, that exceed our scope, but are definitely important. And yes, that, that is a huge driver. Let's see, Chris provided a few other follow-up questions. It sounds like um, she's asking about the table, and I think she's referring. Chris, are you referring to the table for fish migration? Um, uh, Wendy, he already answered my question. Oh, great. OK, excellent. We have a few more minutes, so other other thoughts, reactions, questions? I, I do want to reemphasize, though, that, um, you know, when you're looking at these, um, you know, 1D hydraulic modeling results, um, I mean, you need to think about the fact that in a normal stream channel, there's going to be highly varying velocities within the channel 
you know, just, you know, within between the boulders, between the cobbles, um, with all the, you know, various, um, you know, depth changes. Um, and so, you know, just looking at the average velocity isn't really telling at all of, of you know, the conditions that the fish is going to experience within the channel and, and, and shouldn't be considered a limiting factor. So for the design, I mean, I think we really need to look at the fact that there is going to be these just huge diversity of velocities within the channel that are generated by the features in the channel. And those are going to be the important limiting factors for the fish. Completely agree. And um, just so you know, this this 1D hydraulic model was a uh, very quick first pass um, to look at concepts, but the, the actual scope does call for um, SRH 2D modeling and um, more extensive uh, modeling, which Travis and Nathan can talk about. Yeah, yeah, to get to the 2D model, you basically need a design surface so the velocity variability you talk about will depend on the roughness variability and the topographic variability. So creating that surface with all the design features is a pretty big effort. So the 1D is just to get an idea at some of these average velocities if we're in the right ballpark, and then that can be further refined with the 2D model. Yeah, I just would hate to see you kind of start to eliminate um, you know, minimum designs um, based on average velocities when that's really not what the fish is going to experience within the channel. So um, I, I think that that's a really important concept to stay focused on, um, you know, that, that the, the fish is going to experience something much different than the average. Excellent. I totally agree. Uh, we agree. Thank you, Chris. OK, other comments or thoughts, questions? OK. OK, and you can always continue to uh, send questions later because I know this is a lot to process virtually. So let's move move forward. Does Tim up? I'm sorry, what? Tim Brick. Hi, Tim. Wayne. Oh, go ahead, Tim. Well, I'd like to say how exciting this presentation has been uh, because I think it represents a real a real turn in how LA River planning uh, is being considered with great sophistication. And I, I commend each of the pre presenters for the, the care and uh, scope of the analysis that they've provided here today. And I, I would say that the shift here is towards viewing the LA River really uh, in terms of biology. <laughs> and and uh, fish restoration and aquatic species rather than just being a recreational and real estate emphasis such as we've had for much of the other planning. So I think this study is just very exciting in terms of its potential to really uh, lead to a very historic restoration of the river system itself and the health of the river system itself rather than just viewing uh, LA River restoration as being a, a more limited you know, recreational or real estate play. So thanks so much for all of the presenters and thanks for Stillwater and you, Wendy, for putting together such a great team. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate your leadership and um, history in, in the watershed, which is, is so important, along with our other partners um, and um, all, all of the agencies, very, very important, and, and the nonprofits. Thank you so much for your leadership. Let's move on to the next, which is really a wrap up, um, and then some look ahead. So um, don't don't sign off yet. There's some really interesting things that Isaac's going to share. Uh, very visionary looks for us to ponder for the watershed. But very specifically, next steps will include um, incorporating all the feedback from all of you from this workshop and working on pushing forward to deliver um, not just responses to your comments in a meeting summary, but really producing a basis of design report for the preliminary design alternative evaluation at 30% level design. And that will be available for your review um, coming up this summer. 
Along with that, uh, we will have a follow up preliminary design meeting where we will share the results of that alternative evaluation and you'll have another opportunity to provide input comments and your best thoughts to make this project a success. Along with that, in parallel, we will continue on our CEQA and uh, um, corollary NEPA related requirements along with the regulatory strategy. Um, as you've heard, there's some very important questions to address. And then finally, selecting the preferred alternative will come out of this process and move the project forward to its final milestone under this WCB grant, which is 60% design set drawings. So let's go to the, oh, and so we just want to acknowledge again WCB and this grant through Prop 68, the leadership of the city, the Council of Watershed Health, all of the agency uh, leaders and partners, as well as our nonprofits. And so the schedule, I won't go into detail, but you can see there's a lot of parallel tracks going on, but three major tasks. There's the overall project, uh, administration and outreach. We just talked about there's another opportunity coming up this summer. We will be sending you all um, a doodle poll to figure out when we can have that next meeting. There's the design, which we're into, and we're get, approaching 30% design deliverables. Um, along with the basis of design report, draft, and final. Um, we're, we're also coordinating very closely with other project partners like Metro with their bikeways project since the study areas do align, um, as well as the Arbor Reach and, and other things. And then finally, um, the CEQA, the NEPA, and all of the related permitting, um, it's really more of a strategy on the permitting side we do not need to submit permits as part of this grant. This is a planning grant, but the next phase will be an implementation grant, uh, which will include complete submittal and securing of permits. Um, next slide. So now we're gonna just segue for Isaac to talk about bigger picture watershed concepts for steelhead recovery. All right. So. I've got the concluding remarks here, I guess, on this uh, big idea. Um, and like AJ mentioned earlier, um, you know, how do we, you know, none of this works without the whole watershed. So we need to think about the whole watershed and, you know, chart a course for the whole watershed as much as we can. And so, you know, at, at the very minimum, you know, we know there's good habitat above Devil's Gate Dam uh, in Arroyo Seco. If we can get there, um, and if we can engineer the channel uh, to the coast for fish passage. So that's kind of the minimum minimum steelhead recovery that that we would need to make this work. Um, and so that's, you know, that our assumption is that could work. We could get steelhead with that minimum. Um, next level, level two watershed concept is really kind of where, you know, most most people you know, think think we should go. I think ultimately is is getting up to Big Tahunga. You know, can we get um, can we get uh, around Devil's Gate in Arroyo Seco and 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 even get up to the really good habitat up at uh, Brown Mountain Dam and above that um, the Brown Mountain Dam potentially removal um, and then getting up to Big Tahunga. You know, you need to get around Hanson Dam um, and, and create by uh, fish migrating through the upper uh, the Tahunga um, area and we know we recently had the LA River upper LA River um, plan that's looking at that um, uh, looking at potentially looking at that uh, and could that be leveraged um, to to make that move forward um, you know down lower we also have uh, for migrating we have a, a Legion Valley you know potential you know can that be more than just migrating perhaps could it be uh, rearing habitat as well and then finally wait way down at the coast a uh, key piece would be the la river um, lower la river re revitalization plan they've got opportunity areas uh, delineated um, preliminary design plan program elements for those areas and and those that those really could you know potentially support 
this critical life cycle stage of, of the rearing and transition back to the ocean, if we can get those flood floodplain connections down at the lower LA River. Um, so that pro project is well on its way. So, um, you know, this doesn't seem too far out there that we could have uh, have a bigger picture watershed at the level two. And then, then, then we went even further with level three. And so I, I'm a landscape architect by training in addition to ecologists and um, I've always found a lot of value in exploring the limits of what's possible, you know, and, and sometimes you end up with some radical things, but a lot of times when you go out there, you also end up with low hanging fruit that you didn't know you had. So we, we've got these level three and I'll show you level four really quickly. You know, can we think bigger? Could we even think about potentially getting up to Bacoima Wash for spawning? Could we somehow get up um, Rio Hondo and get to some of the tribs up there in Santa Anita Creek? Um, you know, there's uh, you, you know, you think about the reality that Whittier Narrows Dam is the key impediment on Rio Hondo. However, we know that's the mo one of the most um, high risk um, flood flood hazards in the country and is being considered for redesign. So could we, you know, could we leverage that for a fish passage in that design? Um, and then finally, the 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 max recover ideas. This is where we're really exploring. You know what are the limits of what's possible, and so this is just a big collection of ideas that that we we've thrown out there. Um, and some of these are a little radical, but some some might not be so radical. Um, and this is kind of a long conversation to go through all of them, and we're getting toward the end. So maybe I'll just point out a few. Um, you know, one one of the ones that I think is kind of neat is the we've got a um, a rail line plan to go to Santa Ana. Um, from from Union Station downtown LA, and you see this um, dotted blue connector between the San Gabriel and the LA River just below the Rio Hondo. Um, that's a big wide rail corridor that's going to get a new rail line. You know, what if we could actually connect um, to the San Gabriel River there? And what if then we could connect the San Gabriel River back to its estuary at the Seal Beach Marine Reserve? You know, could we actually have an estuary again in this LA River? you know, complex, you know, kind of radical, but we know the LA River watershed has always been radical. We, knew, we know it's it historically flowed with the San Gabriel River at times. It flowed out at Bayona Creek at times. So, you know, ideas like that, could we explore them? Could we explore connecting to somehow getting over to Dominguez Wash and, and Machado Lake down in the port to create more estuary habitat? Um, so, you know, I guess finally I'll add is, is some of the uh, tributaries in um, the Elysian Valley. Um, you know, there's Hollenbeck Lake that is being rehabilitated um, down in um, Boyle Heights. Um, these lakes and a lot of these tributaries have pretty shallow groundwater. Could we somehow connect those groundwater sources to create some really good habitat potentially in, in the really urban areas that, you know, may be able to support some stage of the life cycle? Uh, so those are ideas that we're collecting and we'd love to hear if people have more or thoughts um, that we can add to this um, collection. And so I think I'll stop there. Great. Um, let's see. So we, we do have um, one more moment where we can open up for reactions and questions um, before we just thank you all. So um, Sabrina had a question about looking at in our fisheries approach for the conceptual model. So AJ can address this. Um, estimating small production for different trips, opportunities to support big picture prioritization. OK, uh, yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Just looking at your question here, would your conceptual modeling try to estimate smolt production for different tributaries to support big picture prioritization? Yeah, um, we have not planned to do um, a population model. We do have the capability and we've done that in other systems to estimate smolt production. Um, that would require a lot of additional data collection on conditions or a lot of um, assumptions at least uh, conditions in these tributaries and we would love to be able to do that and I would hope that we could do that as part of future projects where we do look closer at tributary habitat um, Arroyo Seco being one of them that we um, we have actually you know started looking at carefully with Tim and, and others 
uh, at the Arroyo Seco Foundation and other partners, um, City of Pasadena. Uh, and again, we would we would love to do additional work in tributaries to see what the production potential is up there, but we do not envision that as part of this project. Thanks. Okay, other other questions folks have? <coughs> Sounds like everybody's ready for lunch. <laughs> OK, let's go to the next slide. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating in our workshop. We really, really value your participation, your time and your thoughts and very important follow up. Um, thank you so much for the Army Corps uh, raising the O&M questions for Chris Medic telling us to really pay attention when we talk about limiting factors and not um, uh, limiting um, fish passage in any way. Um, and, and we take that to heart. And thank you to everybody else for your comments. Um, really appreciate it. And so um, I'm going to let Eileen, if Eileen's still there, close us out um, with, with our last slide. Eileen still there? Oh, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> there I am. Sorry, Wendy, I am here. It's okay. like the whole new thing gets me every time. So, um, but th thank you, Wendy. Thank you for putting together a great program. It's a lot of really good information. Everyone has been working really hard the past few months. Um, and I, I also like to thank all of our presenters. Um, it's certainly given us a lot of food for thought in the coming weeks as we kind of think and think these through and incorporate the comments into what we'll be following up with everybody on. And I'd like to thank everybody who's been participating. Um, there's a lot of work here that we're building on from many of you, and we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. And I'd also, just you know, a couple more thanks to um, the Wildlife Conservation Board, again, for supporting this important study. It's leading to some really interesting conversations that I know we've all been anxious to have, and it'll be really nice to come back and, and um, continue the conversation. So thanks to our partner agencies, our nonprofit organizations that have contributed time and expertise, and certainly to my team, Andrea, Kath, and Urelli, who have been working really um, diligently with Wendy and her team. So thank you all again. We're looking forward to coming back and collaborating again on um, what, we've, what we've learned today and where we can take this. Um, kind of just thinking about Isaac's vision that he shared is, is going to help lead that conversation in the coming weeks. So looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.